Welcome, everybody. My name is Katie Curtis, and Reed, thanks so much for that um, welcome. It's always such a pleasure to be at the the Senior Center with our Bainbridge Remembers Oral Histories program. Before we get started, this uh, these stories that are coming to you um, come from uh, the Suquamish Territory. So I'd like to read the land acknowledgement. Uh, every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and every grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. That was Chief Seattle in 1854. And um, we acknowledge the land uh, where these stories come from are the, is the land of the Suquamish people uh, who live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. Thank you, everybody. Um, so for today, again, I'm Katie Curtis. I'm the Education Outreach um, Manager for the Bainbridge Island Historical Museum. And our topic today is about just last year <laughs> and um, what a historic year it was. Um, we are, uh, I've, in, I've invited um, some honored guests and I'm going to allow them to speak for themselves. They're gonna tell us stories of their own experiences um, in a reaction to George Floyd's murder last year and um, how Bainbridge Island came to terms with um, Black Lives Matter's uh, issues and the difficult times of last year. And so I think what I'll do first is ask them each to introduce yourselves. And I'll start with uh, Spencer. Will you please give an introduction? Absolutely. Hello, my name is Spencer Bissum. I am a first year college student at the University of San Diego, still online, unfortunately. Um, but I did graduate this past year from Bainbridge High School in 2020. I've been fairly active in our community with social justice initiatives, uh, different extracurriculars for high school, and just trying to really be um, be active and be involved in the community. So I've been a high school student until now, but I'm still trying to find ways to stay engaged. So thank you so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And um, who do we have with you today? We have your mom. <laughs> we have Brandy. Brandy, would you be willing to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you so much for having me. My name's Brandy Bisvam, and I have lived here on Bainbridge Island for the last 15 years. I am an educator. I have been a teacher since 1990. Um, when I graduated college, I joined a group called Teach for America, and that started, I was in the founding core of that group. Um, and uh, taught, met my husband, uh, who was also a teacher at the same middle school that I was at, and uh, we uh, had a life in California that was uh, cut short by the Rodney King riots in 1992, and we moved up to Central California, where we were only planning to stay about a year, but things change, and we lived there 13 years where we got married and went to graduate school. My husband went to law school. I went and got my master's in education. We had two houses, we had two kids, and when it was time to uh, see our children getting ready to enter school, we decided that we wanted to try to find a different place to raise our kids. And so we will truly say that as a biracial family, we looked at every place in this country we could go. And my father had lived or was living on Bainbridge Island and we liked Seattle. And we really liked um, the community feel. We liked uh, the schools and we reordered our lives to live here. And we knew that uh, we were not going to be moving to a place where we did not see a lot of non-white people. And for us, that was definitely, absolutely a consideration. But at the time, 
Uh, we believed that we could take our kids to Seattle enough so that we could give them um, other people to look at that were not white people. And so uh, we moved to Bay Ridge Island in 2006. And uh, five years ago, I joined uh, BISD as a teacher at Woodward Middle School, where I teach now. I'm on my lunch break. I teach seventh grade world history. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, so that's a great, I always ask people like, how did you find yourself on Bainbridge Island? And so it's always interesting, um, you know, for people who did move here, what were, what were the reasons? And of course, we know a lot of times it's the reasons are the schools. So I just want to do a quick check with um, Spencer. Uh, do you remember moving to Bainbridge Island and when you first kind of felt like an Islander? Was it automatic or how did you, how did you feel when you moved here? And tell us a, just a, two sentences about that. Yeah, um, I have very, very vague memories of actually moving here. I remember playing with my next door neighbors sort of the first few days after we had gotten and been moved into our house. Um, and I would say that I, I really started to feel like an Islander in maybe second, third, fourth grade, kind of when I knew people, I had been around the island um, and I was kind of starting to grow into this idea that, okay, like this is my, my class, my classmates, my friends, and I have a real community here. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly ended up <laughs> becoming a leader um, in that community. And I, I got to know you um, because uh, Brandy first joined the Multicultural Advisory Council um, and uh, for the school district. And then as a student rep, uh, we were lucky because you just stepped right up. And I think you stepped right in at maybe, was it ninth grade or eighth? I think it was ninth grade. Um, mm -hmm. That's my memory. I it also could have been sophomore year, but I remember remember sitting in for at least a little bit uh, my freshman year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that 2020 was a year that was full of challenges, and they were mostly negative. Um, for many, the most painful uh, for the nation was witnessing the murder of um, Joy, George Floyd. And so Spencer, I, I am so grateful um, that as a gift to your community here, uh, you're willing to share your perspective. Uh, will you please tell us where you were and, and what you experienced on in your community on Bainbridge here? Of course, yeah, thank you. Um, I, of course, George Floyd was not the first black man BI POC to be murdered at the hands of the police. Um, but it was sort of the first time that I had seen a real public response on the island. At that time, I was in um, high school, it was my end of my senior year, and I just really have no memory of at any point for any other of these injustices, seeing my classmates speak out or be frustrated or the community speak out. Um, but I remember the day that the riots here erupted in Seattle or the protest turned into a riot in Seattle, and I was very intent on going, but I had been swayed, thankfully. Um, shout out to my mom and dad. Um, but I remember wanting to wanting to have a space to talk about and process those things. So I hopped on Instagram and I just put out to my own followers, hey, if anyone wants to talk about what's happened today, what's happened to George Floyd or anyone else uh, this spring, I'm just gonna host a Zoom conversation and we can just come and talk about it. And I ended up getting like 20 or so uh, students, some college, some high school to come and discuss how they had been feeling. And it turned into a really positive space um, that I was able to replicate more throughout the spring and summer. I hosted a lot of different Zoom conversations, mainly um, on the topic of race in the United States, um, but on a different variety of social justice issues as well. Um, I also did have the privilege of planning and or planning part of and speaking at the George Floyd tribute, which was again, a really shocking um, display of solidarity in our community. Because again, um, growing up black on the island, I just, I had felt attuned to those issues. I had known that those things were going on and no one seemed to want to talk about them. And so to see 1000 plus people come out and show support for uh, defunding the police was really, really um, astounding. Mm -hmm. I can't, I mean, I really can't imagine uh, how it must 
feel. Uh, and I think all of us felt unsafe in a, in, in that shared essence of, yes. of that. And um, so it sounds like uh, many of your peers and um, were looking for places. What were some of the what were some of the things that they either asked you or maybe that they told you that um, were interesting? I think one of the things that is at the essence of, of racism or any other social justice issue is people's experiences. And that's one thing that I really felt had been neglected by the school district, uh, specifically in their equity efforts and in people here on the island. We just don't have a lot of numerically percentage wise. We don't have a lot of people's experiences to draw on, but the people who we do have here are very, very vocal, very proud of their identities. And even so, I I had been struggling and developing my identity racially for however many years, but that was, again, really the first time where people seemed like they wanted to hear about that. And in doing so, realized like, hey, we do have people of color here who we can talk to and learn from and take your cues from when doing or working towards racial justice. and. That felt good. It was a little bit overwhelming to have so many people come and ask me, well, how does this feel? And how did this make you feel? But I think, oh, I, after a little bit of time, I was able to adjust to that and mm -hmm. start being able to answer people's questions and give them meaningful feedback and not just be blindsided by, oh, my goodness, like everybody wants to hear from me. Why now? Why all of a sudden? Why this one thing? But I think, mm -hmm. I think in hindsight that it was not good, but, but it was a breaking point. And mm -hmm. I don't know how people would have arrived at that conclusion that, that they need the meaningful feedback from people of color otherwise, unfortunately. Right. right. It's like you you were put upon because all of a sudden everybody was anxious to hear from you. Yes. <laughs> and yes, your story definitely uh, needed to be shared and there wasn't a prior um, space for that. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I'm mm -hmm. going to um, ask Brandy, you know, um, in terms of uh, you're, you're, you know, the white, your white mom, you know, uh, and so it might have been, uh, did people come to you or how, how did, how did people respond for you? What, what was it like on Bainbridge for you, you know, at that time? So thank you for the question. Um, so I have two wonderful sons. They are both biracial sons. And I have a wonderful husband who is actually an immigrant from South America, but he is seen as African American, as an African American American. Um, and I would say that uh, when the murder of George Floyd happened, in our family, it was also a breaking point. Uh, we had watched the murder of different African-American people over numerous years, and we had seen not much happen. We also were in the middle of the pandemic, just like everybody else was, and emotions we acknowledge were high. So it was, Spencer, we were trying to plan a graduation that wasn't what we thought it was going to be. We were in the midst of kind of making big decisions for him. And so, so here this horrible thing happens. And, uh, and I panicked, I must say that uh, I was sick to my stomach uh, and panicked over the idea that I am raising two men of color to go out into this world. And they are both incredibly smart, incredibly gifted, incredibly kind. But I understand that when so many people see them, they don't know that about them. They just see their color. And when the murder of George Floyd happened, all I could think about was, I'm getting ready to send my son to San Diego. And what's going to happen to him one night when he wants to do a late night taco run and the car gets pulled over? What happens to my kid? So that was all that was going on in my head during that time. And it was really interesting to me because I had a lot of my friends who reached out to me who said, I'm so sorry. And some said nothing. Some would just act like there was nothing going on in the world. And I was, I was so amazed that um, my reaction was, I want you to be angry. I don't want you to be sorry. Sorry doesn't do it for me. I want us to all get angry that this is what's going on right now. And I'm panicked. And I want you to feel my panic 
because I'm getting ready to send my kids out into this world and I don't want them to die. So that's where I was when the murder of George Floyd happened. And, uh, and, and it kind of built to a place where I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. And so uh, my, I was watching my son who started these Zoom conversations and I, I kept wanting to say, well, you know, Spencer, why don't you do a Zoom conversation with these people? Or why don't you ask this person to Zoom with you? And finally, somewhere my head thought, hey, stop asking your kid to do this work. He's doing his work. Where, what are you going to do? You need to do some work. There's nothing stopping you from having a Zoom call. So social media. So I threw out. So I was so one day I was I, I felt compelled and I made a big statement and I wasn't sure if I should put it out or not. And I I put it out. I didn't think I did, but I actually did, which is probably good, because if I thought too much about it, I wouldn't have put it out there for everyone to see. But it basically was a plea. It was just a plea to fellow white people that in this moment, when everyone's wondering, what do we do? Like the thing we've got to start being able to do is talk about race. That's what we've got to be able to start doing. That's our beginning spot. And if people couldn't even say to me, you know, Brandy, this is a terrible thing that's happened and I don't know what to say to you, but I, I just want to hear from you. If my friends couldn't even say those things to me, I, I know that we as white people, we need a lot of help and we need to start being able to talk about race. So, so then I got such a response from that that I said on my Facebook page, I'm looking for five people who would talk about race with me. And I was flooded. I was flooded with people who were willing to say, I said, all I am asking for is three hours of your time. We're going to meet for one hour, three times. And let's just begin getting comfortable about talking about race. And so what happened for me this summer was, my goodness gracious, I had uh, women and they were women. Women responded to this and, uh, and they were white women. That was my audience. And, uh, and I am grateful for the women that came forward to talk about race. And uh, they were from the island, but they weren't just from the island. They were from Texas. They were from California. They were from the Northeast and uh, people who just were willing to start an uncomfortable conversation and recognize that it was something that they were not comfortable doing. Uh, one thing that I said, uh, in sort of my statement and said was, you know, race comes up in my family. We, my kids were raised. We talk about race every day in my family in some way, in some way, whether it's small or large, race comes up every day. And what I knew was that from my white friends and white families was that that is not something that comes up every day. It's not a conversation that happens every day in their homes. So to be able to begin to, you know, when, when you don't do things, when you don't do things, they are very uncomfortable doing. So we approach this in each of my groups as practicing to talk about race. And we created a very safe space with norms and rules of how we would honor each other and listen to each other's experiences. Um, we asked questions and, um, and, and, and it grew. Oh my goodness, it grew. It grew from doing one group to I had six groups going. We read different books together and we carried ourselves right up until um, the fall when I needed to start back to school. And a lot of these women are teachers and they also had different jobs they had to do. So we created our own uh, Facebook group. Uh, we're, we're a group of 60 now uh, that span across the country. And our work is uh, being better doing the work to be anti-racist. And so we are getting ready to start up again in just a few weeks. I've got, um, so I've got again, probably 25 women that are putting themselves out there to talk about race and to begin the practice of talking about race and what that means. And we will be reading uh, two books this winter and starting on that. So I was amazed at the people who were willing to do that and to do the big work and to not stop, but to continue the conversation. And for my, I'm biased, of course, but these are brilliant women 
who go out into our community and not just here, but uh, one of the women from Texas started her own equity team at her school. And we've been meeting through the fall and that has started work in Dallas, Texas that had not been going on at a school. Um, another woman that I worked with, she started equity work at her school in the Northeast, a private boys boarding school that had not ever done equity work. So. So the time is right for this work. This is this is our time to uh, to as white people get uncomfortable and talk about race. Thank you. Wow, what a story! Oh man, that's incredible. And I was on the sidelines, and I remember just knowing that you were going full stream ahead, and it's like that that calling that you just really were a leader, not only for our, our community, but for others. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I, uh, I want to go back to Spencer and because Spencer, your mom mentioned it's time to get uncomfortable. And um, I know that maybe uh, you'll share the story of when you thought the same thing before all this happened, and um, you were on a TED Talk. Yes, I apologize. I was just making sure I had the right link for that. Um, and on February 2nd, I believe, of 2020, I was privileged enough to give a TED Talk, a TEDx Youth Talk, here at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts. Um, and I do have the link for that. I will um, attach it or put it in the chat. I will get it to uh, all of you. Uh, by the end of the meeting, but it was about the importance of being uncomfortable, not just when talking about race, but how um, when we open ourselves up, we allow ourselves to be vulnerable. It really is the only time when we grow. And specifically with race, I don't think that that's an issue that this community by, by nature, again, of demographics that we have to talk about or have to acknowledge a lot. And so, of course, those conversations about race, about what Black people and Indigenous people and um, Latinx people experience on a daily basis, that's not going to be a familiar or comfortable conversation. But if we really want to be attuned to those experiences and the needs of those people, we have to have those conversations. We absolutely do. And I think it's worth saying that, Mom, I, I just, I think you took the conversation thing way farther than I did. And I am just so proud and humbled as your son to bear witness to all of that, all your equity efforts in the district. So if if you are not plugged in with my mom or with me, I would encourage you please to, in your family, in your community, with your friends, whoever you're talking to, please start having those conversations about race. I know it's not fun. I know it's not easy, but it just is what needs to happen for those of us who are still alive in these troubling times. Wow, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, there was an incident um, that uh, was difficult to respond to on the island. And uh, then again, you took some leadership and you ended up responding. Can you tell us about that incident um, of painting the rock? Sure. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, at the high school, we have a tradition, or they, they have a tradition um, to paint the rock that is on the grounds right next to the Commodore building in the parking lot for students uh, down by the high school gymnasium, the lower gymnasium. And back in the spring, some of my classmates and I decided it would be a good idea to paint the rock with BLM, Black Lives Matter, on the front, not necessarily as a direct um, acknowledgement of the political organization, but just kind of as a, a, a show of solidarity with Black lives on the island, in our community, and beyond. Um, and of course, that was met with controversy. People graffitied it. We would paint over it. I, myself, and my brother were there a lot of the time fixing messages and at times anti-Semitic and racist things that people had written on it. But um, I think it kind of came to a head when I was driving by one day and I saw some assumingly white supremacists painting over the rock and filming a video of it, painting their symbols from their group or wherever they're from. I believe in Bremerton. I'm not attuned with their crowd, so I don't know their organization's name. But I took a video of that and it got posted to Facebook 
And that was when I think the community really started having a discussion about, well, do we want BLM on the rock? Is that too political? Is that not political enough? And it was frankly, I was a little disappointed in the community and in the high school, the high school for not taking more initiative with that um, in, in showing support for, for black lives in the community for such a simple and not meaningless gesture in the grand scheme of things, but something so simple to become so controversial really uh, upset me. Um, but eventually, I think The Rock actually is currently graffitied um, with Ensley Sucks and USA, but uh, that will be soon hopefully covered up. And again, it will return to the Black Lives Matter Rock. Yeah, I um, remember being surprised uh, learning about how frozen we can all get. I mean, you you came right out and were clear about um, uh, the corrections and you know taking action, um, but but um, you know even going to authorities, it was it it was a little bit difficult, wasn't it? Yeah, um, the police were aware of the incident. Uh, they did know who was responsible for it. We were able to give them the license plates of the cars that the two men who were painting uh, drove. And because The Rock is a property of the high school, I don't know legally or if it's just really commonplace that only the students are supposed to paint The Rock. Uh, but that is the truth. Um, that is the, the rule that's currently in place. And so technically it was vandalism for them to come all the way from wherever they came from and paint on The Rock but uh, the police didn't really take any action. They were pretty stagnant. They had all the information they needed and they chose not to do anything with it. So uh, feeling a little frustrated again on that point, but I, because of the, the political nature of Black Lives Matter, sadly um, that it's misunderstood by millions of people here in our country, I really didn't personally expect the police to do anything about it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and that reminds me, uh, going back to what your mom said about the reactions of people um, who are, um, you know, white people like like myself and people who love and have family, you know, that are people of color and, and um, how frustrating it is to... Uh, know that people love you but they're not by your side yeah you know and mm -hmm. so um i hope that what is your what is your hope for bainbridge um you know in terms of lessons and um what do you think are are things that for 2021 you can see this the the, the seeds are planted i think that in his letter to the Birmingham jail, everyone always points to MLK as this loving, you know, very patriarchal figure of the civil rights movement in the 60s. But in the letter to the Birmingham jail, he really does talk about what I see on Bainbridge, which is the struggle with the white liberal population. I think that Bainbridge is a place where there is so much money, so much uh, influence, um, a lot of just privilege that people need to figure out how to start using that. And there are a lot of great resources to figure out how to do that. I think, again, the Multicultural Advisory Council going and looking at what they're offering, the Race Equity Task Force, I believe is the Kitsap local organization for that. Um, the ACLU of Washington on their website has action items to uh, engage with in your community. And again, um, I think that the school district really uh, is, is failing to address the needs of their BIPOC students um, in providing them safe spaces and giving them the academic support that they might need in such a uh, an environment that might not be suited to their cultural or uh, other kind of needs. And they're also failing to recognize the people in the district that are doing the most uh, equity work. They're not putting those people forward, they're not lifting them up. And to me, that's a real, um, a real tell of where their true values are. So if you're at all interested in learning more, uh, contact the school district, reach out to me. Um, and then I'm hopeful that that is a place in our community where we can really make it a safe space for our, our students of color. Yeah, thank you very much. The, um, 
Bainbridge, uh, I think it's the Race Equity Task Force, um, uh, is a city uh, committee now. Oh. And it was, and it was a, it was something that was started, you know, two years ago. And with all that's going on, it was a fight still, but it is a permanent. Um, yeah. It's something permanent now. And then there's something called um, E-Race, which is yeah. also another group that's um, working on this kind of um, all over, actually all of Kitsap. And um, yeah, the Multicultural Advisory Council is also a place where people can um, research or, or come to. And so um, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, Thank I'm going to ask Brandy. Uh, so imagine that you're, you know, <laughs> you don't have to imagine, you're a seventh grade teacher and um, you're what, like, I just was imagining what it could have been like when you couldn't walk into a classroom and watch the children, the students, you know, and what it was like. I'm wondering what was it like for you that week after, how did you connect with those students? Um, great question. So, so I would say that for me, being a social studies teacher, excuse me, I'm gonna clear my throat. <coughs> excuse me, and also being a teacher through the Rodney King riots and having a group of students that I came back to after those riots, I kind of, I kind of went there in my head of we need to, we need to go forward and talk about this. Um, and that, again, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a whole range of comfort with that, um, being white, being teachers, being afraid um, of having a really difficult conversation with a class. Um, we started, my classes and I talked about images that we saw. We talked about feelings and how you might feel scared, but what else might you feel when you look at images here? Um, as a social studies teacher, I try to stick a lot to facts. Certainly, that's my job is to be fact base and provide a historical setting. It's not to be political with my students. And and of course, uh, when everyone's charged, that that is even harder, I feel like. It's, I truly feel like it's, it's navigating a minefield, right? Because everyone thinks they know what uh, is getting ready to be said or done. So it it is difficult. I, a shout out to all of our teachers uh, with, with trying to teach sensitive, matters right now to try to to try to teach that in a pandemic when we cannot read faces and body language and read our crowd so uh so so i'm bird walking katie just to say a shout out to teachers right now that are trying to navigate all of this and i would say with george floyd that is what we tried to do as a staff at my school we met we gave talking points we tried to help our staff navigate what these conversations might look like um and we tried to be really sensitive to our staff who might not feel comfortable with addressing everything but i but there are many of us who've had a lot of experience with that and and feel more comfortable so we we tried to step in and i'm going to say kind of shoulder some of that um so so i'm a believer that you don't hide from what's going on in the world right now um but it's certainly a different way to process it for a seventh grader as it is for a 10th grader as it is for a high school uh senior teacher so we have we have great teachers uh in our district who are very experienced at being able to navigate that and work with that um, so, so for me, it was to lean in, it was to have this conversation and talk about, talk about what it means and how it makes you feel. Thank you. Um, I, I just want, before we, we, uh, wrap up and open up to questions, cause I'm certain that some, uh, our wonderful audience, thanks everybody for being here, might, might have a specific question or something to share. I wanted to um, ask if, if is there something um, that you want to add to your story, your personal story, in terms of um, just how Bainbridge Islanders reacted to you and to this situation? Um, because it's a marker for history, 
you know, it's a turning point in Bainbridge history. And so if you have something, I'm not, I didn't ask you beforehand, so sorry to put, put anybody on the spot, but, but um, it's like, how would this go down in history from your point of view? And then I want to know, you know, for, for, for Spencer as well. And, um, and then if you would like to hear anything, you know, from, from any of the participants. I would say that one of the real or, or the the crux of racism in our society is that it puts people into categories and makes it so that that's all we see. And so in my life, I try to refrain from keeping things black or white, one or the other, no pun intended. But um, I think that there really are two camps of people, uh, especially now that we've had this kind of racial reckoning in 2020. I think because, again, racism is ingrained, as are so many other ideologies, into the fabric of our society, that if we make no effort, if we just live our lives and are nice people, that we are still racist. If we're not actively taking a stand against um, the injustices that we see, then we are racist, we are sexist, we are homophobic. Um, and so I think that the people who shy away from having those conversations, the people who don't want to take any kind of action steps or learn or educate themselves, those people to me will always be the racist. But those who want to step up and embrace the community and listen to people of color will always be the anti-racist. So I encourage you to think about that as you go about your daily life. Thank you, Spencer. And Brandy, did you have anything to add? I would, I would just add that uh, as a white person who's trying to do some of this work, what I don't see and what I don't have are white men that are stepping forward to have these conversations. I uh, work a lot with white women, and I'm grateful mm -hmm. for that. But I do not, um, I do not, I do not have men that are stepping forward that want to have these conversations and so my hope i uh, don't know that i'm going to rewrite it but my hope would be that as we continue to do this work that we start to see um more more people more men that join these conversations and are willing to um that are willing to be uncomfortable with this topic thank you thank you for that well, um, I would just wanted to check. I can't see the chat from where I am because I'm on a phone, but um, Reed, are there any questions? And if anybody has any questions, um, they can, does anybody have any to speak up and ask? So there are no comments or questions outside of a number of links, uh, which are in the chat. And if you are a member of the Senior Center and we have your information, then I will send those links out. I'll also put them on the YouTube version of this, uh, which should be up in a day or so uh, on the YouTube slash BI Senior Center channel. If you have a question that you'd like to ask and would like to open your microphone, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little hand signal, and that will let us know that, uh, that you have a question. And I see that Rita Riley has already put a hand up. Oh, thanks. I just wanted to say thanks to Brandy and Spencer so much for the work that they're doing, for the work they'll continue to do, and hopefully um, that we can get a group together on Beanbridge, maybe a Facebook group. I don't know what you, you know, exactly how that's going. So, um, but I just want to thank you for your courage um, for doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us today. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I have a question or a comment, I guess a question really, uh, for Spencer. One of the things that comes up, um, and I have actually received a message this morning uh, from a member of the Senior Center, a man, white man, who asked about um, um, the, I think raised the question of the reality of systemic racism. So. His question, I think, focuses on the balance between being a victim and working in a world where racism exists. So does the acknowledgement of systemic racism turn, uh, turn a, a black or person of color into a victim 
or is it is it is there another way to look at that i'd like you to respond to that question i think again going back to the categorization of people i think it's not quite that simplistic i think that um again with any kind of marginalization if you are a part of that group you are inherently a victim but you are you you can be so much more than that i think any black person any person of color that chooses to live their life um carefree as best they can who chooses to live courageously and who might choose to fight against these issues and take a stand i think that those people um absolutely deserve more credit than just uh being victimized and the same goes out to to women uh to lgbt members of the lgbtq plus community i think that to just to just make those people victims is unfair to answer your question and we have a we have a hand raised by Barbara Golden. You'll need to you'll need to unmute Barbara. I'm excited to hear from Barbara. <laughs> I don't know how I made that mistake, but I did forget to unmute. Uh, thank you, everybody, for this opportunity, Reed and Katie and um, the Bishops. Um, this is a great topic. Uh, Reed, I'm very glad that you relate the question from the person who called in. And my response to that is um, one good thing that comes out of the storming of the Capitol by the, the white supremacists, that mob, is that now everybody should see themselves as, if you, if you live in this country, you are a victim or a potential victim of having your government taken over. And hopefully this now becomes everybody's issue, everybody's battle. We're all in this. This is, you don't have to be a person of color to see that this is dangerous. Uh, these people are dangerous. White supremacists are dangerous. Um, people who go with that ideology are dangerous. And they're dangerous to all of us who are um, who live in this country, and I think that's one way of seeing it. As a person of color um, and living on Bainbridge Island, a uh, rather privileged person living on Bainbridge Island, um, I could go a long time without being a victim, a, a, a direct victim. I can just stay in my house and not be victimized. But all of us who, who believe in democracy should be shocked and see ourselves as being in danger of having something happen in this country that does not represent the, uh, the democratic republic that we, that we supposedly are citizens of, or we're residents of this country. So it's like the gun violence thing. If once it comes home, then it becomes a national issue. I think, um, I think this is a national issue. It's not just uh, something that's rest in the laps of people of color or anti-racist people. It's everybody's issue. And that's what I want to say about it. And once we see it as everybody's issue, I think more people will get involved and say, we cannot allow this to continue. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> wow. Absolutely. Wise, wise words. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, somebody, somebody labeled as unknown uh, has put up his hand. Go ahead. You need to unmute yourself, unknown. That would be me. I'm sorry. I don't know how to get my name in the little square. So why, why don't you share your first name with us? Um, my name is Stephen. Um, thanks, Barbara. I agree with you. I think that uh, there's a reckoning that all of us are now uh, fools if we do not uh, take note of. I, I wanted to share as a white male that um, for years I would go to uh, like the Blackbird coffee shop and have conversations with white male friends. Um, in which we would talk about racism, talk about how bad it was, um, recognize the impact it might 
have on, not from our own experience, but what it might be like for people of color to live with that and do nothing um, other than talk. And when George Floyd was murdered, I, I decided it was time for me to reach out to some of my friends, white male friends, and say, look, um, we need to join the demonstration. I, I know that you know that what happened was wrong and that you're against having this happen, but we need to physically be there. And that was hard to do. And, and as you can see, it took a long time for me to reach that point to do it. Um, but I am glad that I did it. And I was pleased with the response of most of my um, my friends who showed up um, at the, the demonstrations on Winslow Way. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, that it it I heard from many many people uh, how it was um, you know finally after all this fight that there were more white men, it seemed. So if there's a start. So go ahead, there's uh, Barbara or Robert, were you gonna talk? Robert, yeah, Robert Golden has his hand up. Hi, um, it, probably with all the information that, uh, that Barbara wanted to convey, uh, she forgot to mention that she also leads a book group discussion that's currently talking, analyzing the book cast. Uh, you can reach her through calling the Cedars Congregation on Bainbridge Island, leaving a message, and uh, either they or one of us will be in touch with you to how to join the discussion. Thanks. Katie, you need to unmute. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, it's great to share resources right here on Bainbridge. I see Kimmy has a question. Kimmy, your turn to unmute. Hi, I just wanted to start off by saying how much I appreciate um, Katie leading this dis very important discussion, everyone's participation in. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, I'd like to address this question to uh, Brandy. You mentioned, uh, I'm a reader, so um, uh, what are the two books that your group um, have decided to read and, um, and, um, and how did you arrive you. at those choices? Sure. So I'm, I'm reaching for books while we talk, while, while I'm here. Um, so I would say that one thing I've learned is that everything has kind of just taken a natural um, path. If you're looking for a beginning book, this would be, can you see it? Is it looking backwards to you? It's, or do you see it correctly? It is, so you want to talk about race? This would be, I would say, uh, maybe a beginning start. Book, which a lot of people have read. And um, then after that, I actually would recommend this book, which is Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, because it has an, an excellent foreword that traces um, sort of systemic racism in our country for the last Oh goodness, I don't, I don't even know. It goes it goes back into the 20th century and really gives a great um, historical this just gives you facts about how Black Lives Matter came about. Um, and so that this book I love for the foreword, but the rest of the book is excellent as well. Um, I would say that the two hot books in our world or society or country, I guess, uh, are White Fragility and 
Uh, also, Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. And these are both really uh, important books I would share with you that for white people, they're probably going to make you pretty uncomfortable. Um, and I don't think that's a problem. I encourage that. But I would say um, it is really great to have a thought thought partner or do this in a book group. Um, and, you know, when I do book groups, we go over our book norms every time about how this is a safe space. And so I want people to feel free to ask questions. Um, and and I would tell you to answer your question that right now we're going back and we're going to redo or I'm going to do again how to be an anti-racist and then also examining capitalism in a world on fire is our other book um, because because there are many people that I've done book groups that have read all of the ones that I just showed you and we're ready to kind of take a, a, another focus looking at another system in this country, which is capitalism. So. I hope that wasn't too much and answered your question. Thank you very much, Brandy. And I, I just wanna thank Kimmy as well. I know Kimmy as well as um, Anne Lovejoy have also been starters of um, leaders who have started things on the island. And um, so, okay, Kimmy, go ahead. No, I thought my hand was, I thought my hand was still up, so I uh, brought it down. But yes, I, I've read those books. I also would recommend um, for be beginners, um, The Warmth of Other Suns, and then uh, read Cass. Um, I would make those core readings just for you to get a fundamental sense of how um, our government has you know, from the beginning of time, uh, used its, you know, resources, I mean, benefited from the backs on the, of, of, of Blacks in particular. So, um, unless we understand our history, I find as Americans to find how we've gotten here. If you just pop yourself into America now, you, I think you need kind of the you know, understanding that we have so racism because it was by design over hundreds of years. And when it's that pervasive, you don't realize you're sitting in it. And um, you have these events coming around, but if you look at the big picture, then somehow I think that, um, I don't know, it just, it just gives you more confidence about knowing where where we are in history. And also I think it'll allow you to think that maybe you can make a difference um, in a real way. I, it's hard to explain, but anyway, thank you. Thanks, Kimmy, thanks so much. Reed, I think there are a couple hands up. Well, I'm not sure, uh, Steve may still have his hand up like Kimmy did. Um, and I see that uh, Linda uh, Espinosa has her hand up. Thank you. Hi everyone, Brandy Spencer. Thank you so much, Brandy. You must be so proud of Spencer. He's an excellent guy. Um, and he, ah, <laughs> it makes me emotional, and it makes me uh, so to look forward for the future to see people like him. Uh, so thank you for that. And you know, as as uh, Kimi said, like this was by design, right? And you can feel so daunting to think how can i as a person make a difference like it's so difficult how am i going to change a whole system but you can start small you can start with yourself and then you can start in all the organizations that you touch every day your school your city we have to look at what is happening in our city like yes we have the race equity task force but is that enough do we have enough people in the council, uh, in the council uh, to, to represent people of color in the island? We just had a situation where <laughs> they were trying not to elect uh, or appoint a person of color. They was as qualified as the other candidate. Why? We have to think about why. 
right? So getting involved, getting your your voice be heard, pro uh, equity and pro um, listening to people of color and adding more people of color to our government. I think that will be super important and the very best thing that you could do in your area. Okay, thank you. Ab absolutely, Linda. And it's um, such an honor to know you and follow the, the lead that you've been leading in the last couple of years. It's been a pleasure to be on MAC and then have you as a panelist on, you know, the very first uh, Latinx panel that we were privileged to have last year. And um, I, we have other panelists as well that are, that are um, participating here. And I feel like we've kind of just warmed up, like just gotten comfortable with each other, but it is time to wrap up. And so I just want to um, thank everybody for being here today. Having 30 people show up uh, to have a conversation like this on Bainbridge Island is such a, um, it's a, it's a good showing. And I think that at least I will be re-listening to the wise words of Spencer and of Brandy because you had so much to teach us. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. And uh, thank you to the um, Senior Center for being brave and hosting these. Um, I know that the Senior Center has its, um, uh, also its study group that's about inclusion. And yeah, Lan Ann, do you wanna just do a quick plug for the study group? I do, thank you, Katie, especially because um, our panelists are gonna be uh, Kimmy and Barbara Golden and Gina Corpus. We're going to meet again here at this same time and on this same link um, on January on Friday, January 22nd. And I hope that many of you will be able to sit in and listen and bring your questions to them as well. Um, we're just so fortunate and so amazingly blessed to have people with heart who are willing to have these conversations and keep having them over and over. It's awesome. So thanks. Thanks to everybody. And I hope to um, get some of you to join us on that next uh, Friday, the 22nd. Thank you. And for the historical museum, um, we our next program is um, going to be about the protests and the impact on Black men in our community. So I have um, we've invited um, three people, different generations, um, and some of them weren't engaged uh, specifically in the protests. But I wanted to get their history. So that's um, the fourth Wednesday. We do that with the uh, with the library. And then uh, Black History Month is coming up. And I am very excited that we're going to have a um, Black women's panel um, the fourth Wednesday of that month. And so everybody, uh, it is 1229. I'm going to wrap up and say goodbye. But um, I am so honored and so grateful. And thanks again to Spencer and to Brandy.